Good afternoon, good morning, good evening to wherever you may be out in the world. Thank you for joining us today. It is a distinct honor for me, particularly as a New Yorker, to be welcoming Dr. Sue Henderson, president of New Jersey City University. Dr. Henderson has dedicated her entire career to empowering students to meet their personal, professional, and academic goals. She started her career as a, as a math teacher back in the day. With nearly 70% of her students eligible for Pell Grants, and these students representing 60 ethnicities and speaking, my goodness, 50 different languages, New Jersey City University truly embodies the vision of swinging wide the campus gates and, and transforming the lives of students and their families and even their, their communities. So I couldn't think of a better person to kind of spend kind of the next you know, 15 minutes really talking about kind of how we chart the future of, of higher education. So with that, welcome Dr. Henderson. Thank you so much for being with us here today. I thought maybe we'd start with your perspective on what makes New Jersey City University so very special um, and your vision for how it serves students and the community. New Jersey City University, we call it NJCU, is an institution where, as you said, almost 70% of the students are Pell eligible, which means they come from modest means. Um, and about 65% of them are immigrants or their children of immigrants. And their diversity is incredibly rich. They're from all corners of the world. And that makes this institution incredibly special. The other piece of it that's very, very important, this institution began in about 1927 with the idea of educating teachers. Uh, it expanded very quickly to really offering a lot of relevant degrees, whether that was fire science or business or accounting. But the degrees were always focused on making sure that you took students who came from modest means and got them an opportunity to have a career, a life, that would change not only the, their lives, but the lives of their families. And we have continued to do that since we've been open, and we've done that in a city that has just begun to explode. Still continuing to have a lot of immigrants here, but they're from so many different places. Where there used to be Italians and Irish and Polish, now you have people from India, you have people from uh, Puerto Rico, the Dominican Republic, you have people from the Philippines, they're just from everywhere, Egyptians. It, it's been fascinating to me uh, to be working in this city that's changing so much and making such a big difference for New Jersey as well as the area. Absolutely. It's, it, in many regards, it's the American dream kind of come to life mm -hmm. on, a, on a college campus. Now, I'd be a bit remiss not commenting on kind of the, the view, the million dollar view, the billion dollar view. I'm not, I'm not quite sure kind of how to, how, to, how to quantify it kind of here. Um, but, but certainly the launching of the business school was, you know, under your tenure, something that was very important to you. And how does that fit into kind of the, the vision and direction of NJCU? So NJCU has been offering a business degree since the 50s. Uh, as a matter of fact, I've talked to alums who graduated, uh, went to, uh, you know, served in World War II and then came back and, and then finished their degree in business and went off to do some amazing things. I, uh, your, your computer and mine has the Unix system in. Sure. Well, one of my alums helped create that uh, back in the day, as they say. <laughs> But uh, we knew that this part of the city, because it's right across the river from Wall Street, is known as the, as the back office of Wall Street, is where they used to do the transactions. Mm -hmm. and the business would close, the real estate here is cheaper, and they would do the transactions here. So what you'll find on this side of the river are all the major financial firms have offices here. And because it's, again, it makes much more sense for them to be doing that. So we have begun to try to transform what we want to do with the School of Business as we created and said, let's think about what a 21st century School of Business should look like. So it's very data driven. Mm -hmm. Whether you do management, whether you do marketing, whether you do accounting, very data driven. We have a financial technology program that was one of the first in the state, data analytics. 
the management program goes every, everywhere from regular management to port logistics management, which is an area of importance to us because we're the third largest port in the country. Uh, so what we're finding is we're bringing real value to this region because of the kinds of degrees we offer, um, because they're much more relevant. The faculty are really doing a lot of really cutting edge research in that area as well as the kind of students we're graduating. We graduate very diverse students and that's what the workforce needs today. So it's an exciting time to be here. <laughs> now having that precision to know kind of what a market needs, mm -hmm. um, not just in the academic programs, but how the programs are, are, are formulated and the types of graduates that will come out of that program, kind of takes a level of, I mean, could we call it kind of high performance um, capabilities of the institution. It's hard for many institutions to kind of achieve that level of precision or agility or capacity for, for innovation. You're, you're leading an institution who's doing that today. Kind of what does it, what does it take? to accomplish that? So that, that's a very important question, particularly in the face of COVID. Uh, I think COVID has put a lot of strain on a lot of business, but particularly higher education. And one of the things that we've focused on here at NJCU is the idea of data-driven decision-making. Uh, now that means you better have the systems in place, uh, you better have the capacity to be able to draw data on that system and then understand what the data means and how that can, how you can effectuate change uh, in order to be responsive to the market. Uh, serve your students, make sure that today's students are being served in a way that they need to be served, which is very different from the students 10 years ago or even five years ago. So it is about data-driven decision-making and having the systems in place to make that work. And we've worked really hard in order to put those things together in a way that's helpful to our campus community, whether it's our students, our faculty, our staff, our alumni, in a way that also serves our community, our greater community, uh, Jersey City and the state of New Jersey better. There's one thing to put kind of tools in people's hands. Quite another for folks to know what to, what do I do with this, this amazing, amazing tool? What types of in initiatives and investments have you had to make to kind of bring your team and your community along with you on that journey? So, I've been fortunate on two fronts. I have uh, a lot of senior team members as well as uh, mid-level managers who really love looking at data and understanding how it can impact things. The other thing that helps is I have a board who's very interested in knowing what the data is and can you show what your ROI is? Why is this important? How is it going to benefit? Whether that ROI is we're going to be a better community because of it or because, well, look, financially this is a very smart thing for us to do. An example of an ROI where we're going to be a better community and it's going to help us ROI financially is we're partnering with Joffrey Ballet. Now the city would love to have a professional ballet company here and Joffrey Ballet is very interested in being here in Jersey City rather than in Manhattan where they're currently located because again, it's cheaper to be here and there's a lot of opportunities and synergies for them. We are now offering their degrees and uh, they will soon be on our campus uh, doing their, their ballet here rather than doing it in the city. So that's an example where the financial numbers worked but it also helped our city in that it helped the arts. So oh, that's that's wonderful. Now I'll certainly be kind of ringing you to find out about tickets to <laughs> student performances in in the future. But that kind of gets to to students, mm -hmm. which is that's the end game kind mm -hmm. of 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 all of this. I mean, a kind of CIO at another institution, an R1, different than NGCU, but the same same mission. She says that every dollar. I can pull out of back office operations mm -hmm. is a dollar I can put against teaching and learning. And that is an, an amazing goal, mm -hmm. of course, but it's incredibly difficult to transform the student experience. Mm -hmm. It's easy to go from spinning up wonderful pilots and small programs. Mm -hmm. It's much more difficult to go from pilot to pervasive and have a sustainable improved student experience. Dr. Henderson, why is it why is it hard? And what are things institutions can do to kind of move the 
I know, the proverbial needle. Mm -hmm. Glad you asked that question. We are just going through that same process of looking at how we can find administrative things and be much more efficient so that we can better serve our students. The question then becomes, how do you take those efforts, whether it's financial or people's times, energy, mm -hmm. uh, and make it so that it serves those students in a better way? And again, it's data-driven decision-making. You know, how, how are the students doing, whether it's surveys or their grades, or what are the pain courses? All that requires a lot of uh, close attention by department chairs, by deans, by faculty members, and making sure that we're moving the needle in the right way. But it isn't just what happens in the classroom. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of data that shows it's the out of classroom experience that's far more meaningful uh, in the front end, not on the back end, but on the front end for students to getting them to stay and persist. And so working with student affairs and making sure that they are connecting all these experiences is an incredibly important thing. We're involved now with something called American Council education a learner lab and the idea is to bring a team together these are a team of faculty staff and even some students who are saying what do we need to be doing to make sure that the student experience is richer and by a richer student experience it's not only having you know a, a good time where they're learning but they're getting the right kind of internships that the courses they're taking that are incredibly relevant so that they're useful when they leave and that we have enough connections with industry so that we know that our degrees are something exactly what industry wants which has been fun oh that's absolutely yeah. fascinating and so well aligned i feel like the, the the research around student experience and student outcomes has, has shifted so greatly from let's personalize that student experience let's be student centric and we're going to give them this lovely personalized experience to kind of being much more how do we empower our students to be to have a student directed experience so I'm, I'm hearing that kind of emerge in the language mm -hmm. well it is the student directed experience because if you think about it once they graduate they have to be self-directed so <laughs> the so idea is help them become independent learners and they have to be self-reflective in how they're learning as well as they're experiencing life so yes, it's an important skill for students to have because again, they're gonna leave us and they will go work in a job. And they'll work in a job market where there's much more fluidity, mm -hmm. where you need to show your value, or if you're not liking what you see at the current job, you're gonna go work someplace else. So I, I think that having that self-directed learning is gonna be really important for our students. And that comes with helping uh, through, like I said, through data decision-making, but also working as a team together. Uh, I remember in one of my campuses I worked at, they called it a high-touch, high-tech. So you want to use technology, but it's also the human touch, which is important. Both are important. On our development team, we talk about how the best solution is the one that our end users never have to use. It simply creates more time and space for those end users to do what they love mm -hmm. to do, which kind of has the most impact, which of course is engaging with with students and helping them kind of on, on their way. So we should talk about the technology. Mm -hmm. It is a technology conference. Yes. What type of ad advice would you give to institutions about how to bring in technology so it's not a shiny toy that we kind of take, oh, look at this kind of cool kind of bit of, bit of technology, but something that actually has kind of a meaningful impact on the performance of the institution, mm -hmm on the experience of the of the student on, on ultimately enabling that student to kind of reach his or her goals my experience with technology and i've worked in three different institutions where in each instance we were implementing technologies the pieces that seem to work the most effectively are starting with a base using it figuring out what works what doesn't work what do we need to then now add or incorporate into it in a more fuller way and then when you add those things on, they need to be deeply embedded into the fundamental reason why you got the first technology. And an example is uh, there's a wonderful technology that people use to track uh, alumni. Well, that data needs to be connected back to the students who are currently here so that I know 10 years from now where my alumni, what they majored in, and where they're working now. And having that all incorporated in a seamless way, it ha means you must be very mindful about how you put the systems together. But that does put a level of onus on kind of you and your team to have a, a relatively built out vision. 
mm -hmm. and a relatively built out kind of understanding of what you want your business processes to be, what you want mm -hmm. your kind of service levels to, to be. Now, but how do you do that? I mean, as, a, as a university president, I, I suppose that the buck stops right, right here <laughs> um, with you, Dr. Henderson, but how do you go about doing that so I would think two words, seamless, but then also deeply meaningful. Okay. So for the student, it needs to be perceived in a very seamless way, mm -hmm. uh, but I'd like for it to be very meaningful in that as the student's experiencing this, that we're getting deep meaning out of it, so we better understand the effects of the things that we are doing, and are they making a positive difference, no difference at all, or a negative difference? So we can adjust what we do, our behaviors, what experiences we have the students involved in, so that you know it's a win at the end. Now, when you get that, have that access to that kind of that kind of data, kind of it's kind of almost the good, the bad, and sometimes it's the it's the ugly. Mm -hmm. How, as a leader, do you contend with? kind of the cultural and kind of emotional, sometimes reluctance to grapple with the ugly. So um, I don't ever see the ugly as the ugly. I okay. just say, that, okay, we tried something and it didn't work. So we need to try something else. Yeah. And the analogy I give frequently, I said, you turn your light bulb on every, on every morning and Thomas Edison did it wrong 1400 times before <laughs> he finally got it right. So we just keep, need to keep working on it. Uh, and you know, you learn from the ugly. You also, okay, why did we choose to do that? What was the premise behind it? And then what didn't work about it? Excellent. It may have been it was a great premise, but we implemented it poorly. It may have been bad premise. Well, we're not gonna do that one again. So just you know, doing some analysis around it and uh, you know, uh, adjusting that and keeping moving. Brilliant. You don't get better unless you just keep working at it. Nope, there's lots of failures <laughs> kind of before, before the success. And right. Thomas Edison in New Jersey, <laughs> a New Jersey resident um, back in the day kind of as, as well. NJCU is in, in so many ways the new modern university, mm -hmm. serving the new modern student over a lifetime. So you're doing what many institutions see at the end of their balance beam. And what type of guidance, kind of last words, recommendations would you, would you offer the folks who are, are listening in today to get, to either get started or perhaps to help their boat go just a little bit faster on that journey? So I think uh, all the institutions of higher education, except for a very, very short few, uh, probably experienced a lot of dramatic change over the last two years. Simply because of COVID, it helped you to really see the pain points in your organization where you might want to adjust. Mm -hmm. Um, this is a day where you would definitely want to be doing that with technology, uh, with data and with data-driven you know, artificial intelligence and data analytics to understand how much more powerfully you can make decisions based on that. And it's, I've seen it make a significant difference and you just get started. You kind of start with the greatest pain point, but keep the big picture in mind so that you build a structure um, that's much more integrated as you're moving forward. So. That is a perfect place to, <laughs> to end. Dr. Henderson, thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure to talk with you today about kind of how to build and advance the performance-driven institution, really building that kind of new modern university and serving kind of the new modern, modern student. So I guess we can kind of, in some ways, kind of end where we, we started uh, with the importance of really serving our our, our customers being relevant, mm -hmm. speaking the same, the same language. And I want to thank everyone out in the audience today for, for joining us for this conversation about how to kind of turn the dial just a bit on being a bit more performance driven, a bit more data driven in the work that we do. Thank you.